thank you, Thor Halverson and the Oslo Freedom Forum for this opportunity. Marlon Brando, one of the greatest actors of all time, also offered some of the most insightful commentary on acting and actors than anyone else ever did. Acting is pig's work, he once said. An actor is a guy who, if you ain't talking about him, he ain't listening. My personal favorite. I'm an actor. I'm only listening now because I'm about to talk about myself and, well, about mining and Ebola. Because doubtless, all of you gathered here today, like me, desire little more in life than to hear yet another actor or musician or celebrity or quasi-celebrity wax insightful on critical matter matters that relate to Africa. So my congratulations to us all for having this wish fulfilled today. Although Ebola now is not only an African issue, but a global one. So carry on, actor. Tell us about the world. This past May, I was in Paris filming the next installments in the Hunger Games series. Tough job, yes. And simultaneously working frantically to finish off the remarks I was to deliver here at the Oslo Freedom Forum that same month. I was invited to speak about Taya, the group I co-founded toward building a 21st century community-inclusive model, a hybrid of commercial and philanthropic investment around gold mining in Sierra Leone, West Africa. The Freedom Forum became aware of Taya this past January after the New York Times Magazine ran an article about our work, rather about my work, I should say, as the Times reporter found no space in his article for the mention of my team, just me, the mad actor out in the middle of the West African bush doing what? No mention of our chairman, who has 40 years' experience building mines in West Africa, our senior geologist who led De Beers' exploration program in Sierra Leone prior to the war, both of whom came on board, yes, because they saw commercial potential, but also because they believed in a business model designed to mine in a better, more socially impactful way. No mention of the 75-year-old retired major general from the U.S. Army who lived in Liberia two, for two years post-retirement and who is the executive director and operational engine of Taya Peace Foundation, our social development vehicle. He's one of the most pragmatic, organized, and analytical people I've ever met and radical in his determination to help implement transformation within the two often neglected communities with, with which we work. I talk, he gets stuff done. No room in the New York Times for him or the 13,000 cacao seedling nursery we worked with local farmers to establish last year as a social investment, the 13,000 more this year, the coffee seedlings, the rice. The Times reporter did find time to note that a few of our workers reminded him during a meeting to which the reporter was invited, note to self, of the new rain gear they hadn't yet received. Ty has been struggling commercially this past many months like the vast majority of mining and mineral exploration companies in the world owing to the collapse in commodity prices. He didn't cover or contextualize that either. He did offer this in his writing. No one among those questioning employees asked what, have must, what, what must have been on the minds of all. You're a famous actor. You cannot buy us ponchos. Adding, perhaps, they were too polite to ask, too fearful, too hopeful. But perhaps, too, that reporter might have asked them, himself, what they thought. They were right there in front of him. He chose instead to filter their perspective through his own and to presume to know their thinking and to give voice to that imagined thinking without inviting them to speak for themselves. And this is emblematic of a much larger pandemic problem with Western perspective on and engagement with places like Sierra Leone. I wrestle with it myself, to strip off Marlon Brando's limitations and to listen. And so there I was late last spring in Paris, trying to write to encaps encapsulate 10 years of work in Sierra Leone in a far more sophisticated way than this reporter from the New York Times. I found myself on my off days from filming in the old Rive Gauche writing haunts of Sartre and Hemingway and Beckett, struggling in my efforts with white wine and sauteed frog legs coming to me more easily than clarity. And then an email two, before, two days before I was to fly here. Oslo Freedom Forum postponed. Yes! Thank you, striking Norwegian hotel workers. More wine and frog legs, please. But today, I'm here clearer and with greater urgency. The frustrations with writing the Taya story were born of larger frustrations with the development of the company. 
From 2003 to 2011, we made steady progress, assembling a strong management team, a good amount of capital from a pool of about 50 investors around the world, led by the New York-based jeweler Tiffany & Co. We had great success with our exploration work, including identifying highly prospective mineralized trends, gold, through an initial drilling program. Our relationships with national government and local partner communities were strong, and then the bottom began to drop out of the global commodities market, and investment monies for companies like Taya dried up. On the social development side, a long courtship with a huge U.S. philanthropic group dragged on, draining focus. For over three years now, we've awaited approval on projects devoted to women's economic empowerment, agricultural development, and community well-being. Poverty allevi alleviation initiatives in one of the world's most economically challenged jurisdictions would just have to wait for the rust to fall from the bureaucratic cogs of that organization. So my head began to hurt from banging against the wall of diminishing returns. And it's not the work on the ground in Sierra Leone that's difficult. It's, it's really not. It's challenging, complex, but doable, and even fun. The greatest difficulty in working in Sierra Leone is to overcome the negative stereotyping narratives like that in the New York Times article, that the West continually vomits up and digests, that prevent people who are capable of the responsible deployment of critical resources from understanding the place and appreciating that despite the significant vulnerabilities there, there are strengths there too, which are even greater. Enter Ebola. The community Taya works with most closely is Pingui Achieftum, situated in the remote northeast of Sierra Leone, across the Moa River from Guinea. Patient zero in this recent Ebola outbreak was a two-year-old boy in the Guinean village of Miliandu, in the country's Zerakore region, which borders both Sierra Leone and Liberia. This unfortunate toddler, it's theorized, came in contact somehow with an infected fruit bat. The sick boy then passed the virus on to his caring mother and other members of his family, perhaps during funeral rites, and the thing spread from there. Miliandu lies approximately 100 kilometers east by road from Pinguia Chieftain. But the 275 kilometer trip from Pinguia west to Freetown, Sierra Leone's port city capital, takes eight hours by car owing to road conditions, which have improved greatly since the rebel war ended 12 years ago. So those 100 kilometers between Pinguia and the Ebola epicenter is farther than one in the West might envision. I've not been on the Guinea side of that border, but the Sierra Leone side I visited at least 20 times in the past 10 years. It is a verdant, beautiful part of the world and one of its most vulnerable. Vulnerable to disease, to elevated infant mortality rates, to economic deprivation, to social instability, to lack of national and global concern, and to misrepresentation that might suggest, for example, that the region is poor. Admittedly, it's easy to form that impression without having to endure the roads leading to the place that Pinguia and its people are poor. Sierra Leone's GDP in 2013 was a humble $4.9 billion. But that was with a 20% jump from the previous year. The World Bank estimates, estimates that the average per capita income for the 6.1 million Sierra Leoneans was about $680 per year. Sierra Leone ranked 177 out of 187 on the 2013 UN Human Development Index. In the immediate aftermath of the recent war, it was dead last, and as a result of this Ebola outbreak, when GDP had been scheduled to expand by 15% this year, it will instead contract dangerously. And if Pinguia is as geographically isolated as I have described, then surely its vital economic st statistics rank it at the bottom of Sierra Leone's modest communities. Yes, true. But the old man, the then paramount chief of Pinguia, Sar Kabase, who in 2003 was the first to invite me to visit the area, never described his home as poor. Quite the opposite. Chief Kabase, a friendly, open man, small in stature, but sinewy and fit. He passed away a few years ago, but no Sierra Leonean lives his 80 or so years without being rigorous of mind and body. The chief implored me to see with my own eyes what his chiefdom had to offer. That area is rich, I recall him saying. We have gold there, 
and chromite. He would roll the R deliciously in chromite. Chromite is the ore used to produce chromium, the durable metal that lends stainless steel its stainlessness. A former employee of Sierra Leone's now defunct national mining company, the chief, had a thing for chromite. We need investors to come to Pinguia, he would insist. We need development. That place is rich. And this is true on the Guinea side as well. Just a couple of hundred kilometers east from the Liandu, Ebola ground zero, in that same Zerikore region is a range of hills called Simandu. Situated there is one of the largest untapped high-grade iron ore resources in the world, over two billion tons of the stuff. Some estimates have iron ore trading at $85 per ton in, in 2015. You do the math. And that's down from previous estimates of over $100 per ton. Semindu has an estimated mine life in excess of 40 years and has the potential to make Guinea one of the world's top iron ore exporters, already one of the world's leading bauxite exporters. Bauxite is the ore uh, used to, uh, to make aluminum. And the ge geologic trend responsible for that ore body disregards international boundaries like the Ebola virus and extends into Liberia as well. And that comparison is not to suggest this iron ore deposit represents a resource curse. I no more believe in that than in the African boogeyman so many Westerners are so hysterically fearful of today. It's simply a fact of contemporary geography. Mining companies from all over the world are developing Simandu as well as the deposits on the Liberian side, creating real value for themselves. But very little production has yet to occur, and because of the nature of national mining codes regarding commercial exploration, little evidence of that value creation is evident locally. And so in December 2013, this two-year-old boy in southeastern Guinea fell sick. And despite the extraordinary wealth of the land he inhabited, there was no viable health care delivery system or infrastructure that he or his mother could access for protection from an aggressive virus like Ebola. And he died, perhaps in the arms of a mother, unaware of the dangers of providing maternal comfort to her desperately ill little boy. As of October 14th, the World Health Organization reports over 9,000 cases of Ebola infection, over 4,500 deaths. One third of all documented Ebola cases were registered in September 2014. According to the United Nations World Health Organization, the epidemic could reach 5,000 to 10,000 cases per week with a current fatality rate of around 70% by December. The less known story is that of women dying in childbirth, malaria rates increasing, children not receiving life-saving vaccines as a result of the crisis. I don't believe that I've told you anything you don't know already. These stories and statistics have led the news for several months. What you may not have heard is this. Ebola is not a death sentence. The world is facing the largest Ebola outbreak in history. Despite the seriousness of the outbreak, there's good news and reason to be hopeful. We're treated early. Many infected with Ebola have survived. Not only in the United States and Europe, but also in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and elsewhere in West Africa. With early, robust medical attention, Ebola is not a death sentence. Ebola? is not a death sentence. Ebola is not a death sentence. No, no, no. Isa Takona survived. Vandy Jawad survived. Dr. Ada Igono survived. Sa Sabas survived. Erickson Toure survived. Fatmata and Tata Sese survived. Mamadi Sion survived. My countryman and friend, Dr. Philip Arilin survived. Ebola is not a death sentence. Ebola is not a death sentence. 
By late May of this year, Ebola had crossed into Sierra Leone from Guinea. Kailan district, where Pinguia is situated, was the first area hit. When we received word that a doctor in Pinguia had been infected by a visiting nurse, we immediately made two calls. First, to the new Paramount Chief, Samuel Jabila, and to a, represent a representative of the World Health Organization. Both told us the same thing. Basic tools were needed to help stave off further transmission. By mid-June, we provided funds to community leaders for the procurement of quantities of chlorine and medical gloves. Later, we provide funds enabling the establishment of 97 public wash stations throughout the chiefdom, all for around $5,000. Since losing that doctor in May, Pinguia, at the heart of this outbreak, has reported no more fatalities from Ebola. UNICEF, I'm told, is, now has a presence there as well. Led by community and by listening, Taya was able to respond early, efficiently, and effectively. Our commercial concerns have become secondary. We've now formed the Ebola Survival Fund Coalition with other groups active in the region which utilize a similar community-based approach, including Nobel Peace Prize laureate Lema Bowie's Peace Foundation in Liberia. My friend, Dr. Paul Farmer, a renowned infectious disease specialist and humanitarian whom I met in Rwanda two summers ago when I visited that country at the invitation of President Clinton to see a world-class hospital Dr. Farmer's group Partners in Health built and staffed in the middle of the remote countryside in collaboration with the Rwandan Ministry of Health, the Clinton Foundation, a consortium of American medical schools and others, recently returned from Sierra Leone and Liberia and has been instrumental Paul Farmer, in the founding of the Ebola Survival Fund. Partners in Health is the leading healthcare group among our coalition. Dr. Farmer is confident that as many as 90% of those who contract Ebola can survive it, and he would know. In 2000, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis was considered an intractable problem in the prisons of Siberia. In the region of Tomsk, an area the size of Poland, a quarter of, pr of prisoners being treated for tuberculosis were dying. Within one year, Dr. Farmer and his team made this number drop to zero, where it remains today. The reason why I'm optimistic about this Ebola outbreak is that I've been ignoring most of the fear-mongering U.S. news reporting on the disease, and instead, I've listened to Dr. Farmer. He has four principles he feels can change the trajectory of the epidemic. First, he says, we must do everything possible to strengthen health systems. The astonishing lack of health workers in all three affected countries is one of the primary reasons that the epidemic has gotten so out of control. According to the Liberian Minister of Health and Social Welfare, even before the outbreak, Liberia had approximately 50 physicians working in public health facilities, serving a population of 4.3 million. Compare that to the approximately 50,000 registered physicians in New York State alone. You might ask, well, doesn't a country like Li Liberia receive foreign aid? And you'd be right. Liberia does get foreign aid, around $571 million in 2012. The problem is that only 3% of that went to national institutions. The rest went to foreign NGOs and international organizations. Imagine you're the Minister of Health in Sierra Leone, Liberia, or Guinea. Health crisis like Ebola hits, and you're responsible for the well-being of your people, but 80 to 90 percent of your country's aid is bypassing your institutions. Your national plan is 90 percent unfunded, and the leading health care NGO in your country has triple your budget. Imagine, too, the temptation toward corruption when your ministry is so woefully under-resourced. Second, according to Dr. Farmer, without high-quality treatment and compassionate care, the epidemic will worsen across the region. Much of the stigma around Ebola is related to its high case fatality rate in West Africa. But when high-quality supportive care is provided, fatality rates will decrease dramatically and people will no longer shun health facilities. Most sites, whether run by international NGOs or national authorities, have not been able to implement these standards to date due to severe staffing constraints and shortages of supplies, including 
personal protective equipment for health workers. Third, community-based care must be a cr critical component of the response. Rapidly securing the space for and building many more properly laid out Ebola treatment units is desperately needed. There are currently meeting less than 20% of the need for beds in Liberia. The situation is similar in the other two most infected and affected countries. As, this, as these facilities are scaled up to meet the level of need, and as referral systems are put in place, community health workers should be trained and equipped to prevent, diagnose, and treat Ebola and other more common afflictions. Community health workers, in order to serve these vital functions, will need not only adequate training, but also adequate salaries. Fourth, new tools are urgently needed for the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of Ebola. While the case fatality rate can be dramatically reduced with the type of supportive care Paul Farmer describes, we urgently need more efficiently more efficient diagnostic tools and effective vaccine and specific therapies targeting the vir virus itself. In addition to addressing the crisis at hand, West Africa also needs world-class medical schools and nursing schools linked to rob robust health systems if, it's, if it is to avoid another health crisis and reestablish the pre-Ebola health gains. Paul Farmer's four principles can be summarized by simply saying, sick people of all classes need treatment based on the best know-how we have. A patient with Ebola, whether in Freetown or Oslo, will need treatment and their communities will need surveillance and monitoring and information. These two critical components must be part of a strong national health system. We should not be distracted by fear, xenophobia, and isolation, isolationism at a time when the world needs solidarity. We know what needs to be done and the political will exists. Over $1.5 billion has already been pledged for the response there. The question is, will we get it right? Will we strengthen healthcare systems as we scramble to get a handle on the crisis? Will we stop the transmission of Ebola while allowing economies of West Africa to collapse? Will we let this tragedy bring out the best in us? If we can act with purpose and unity to realize the four principles Dr. Farmer describes, I trust his assessment that as many as 90% of those who contract Ebola can survive it. This is a message that needs to be heard in Freetown, Monrovia, Conakry, Oslo, Dallas, Madrid, and beyond. This is not the time to shut borders and deny the highest standard of care. This is a moment history will remember, and we, humanity, will be judged by. We have to get it right. We have to crush Ebola now. We can and we must. Thank you.